This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, so thanks for the uh, for the kind introduction. Um, so uh, and and inviting me for uh, sharing some of my research, what I've been doing at uh, at IITA. Um, I will be talking about the precision genetic technologies for for banana. Uh, improvement. Actually, currently, uh, I'm based in, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, because since uh, starting January 2021, uh, I have another role uh, as a director for Eastern Africa hub of, of IITA. But I'm still the lead for the transgenic and the genome editing uh, platform of IITA, which is based in, in Kenya, in Nairobi. Um, so what I will do is I'll briefly introduce um, um, IITA before actually jumping on on my research. So International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, it is one of the one CGIR research centers and it was uh, founded in 1997. So we are over uh, 50 years old and our headquarter is in, in Ibadan, uh, Nigeria. And IATA is actually one of the world's leading research partner in finding uh, solutions for hunger, malnutrition and, and poverty. Uh, we have delivered more than 70% of the CGIR's impact in sub-Saharan um, Africa. And for that reason, actually, IITA was awarded um, uh, Africa Food Prize uh, in, in 2018. Um, so at IITA, we operate actually uh, about 22 countries right now, and we operate with, with different hubs. So we have... Uh, hubs uh, in uh, West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, um, and, and the Southern Africa. So I manage actually the East, uh, East Africa hub, which is actually highlighted in, in yellow here. Um, and we have based in 22 countries, but, but we have operations like, you know, the project based in, in maybe like around 30 countries. And we work on eight different crops like banana plantain, cassava, cowpea, uh, maize, uh, soya bean, uh, and and yam. Just the pointer. Um, so this is our facility um, in, in Nairobi. Uh, that's like we at in Nairobi. Um, the all the tra transgenic and the Gene editing work is based at BECA, uh, which is Biosciences for East and Central Africa at ILRI. Um, and that's where we have uh, the Center for Excellence, the laboratory uh, for uh, like a biosafety level two laboratory and, and, the, and the greenhouses. Pointer. Uh, so as you know that, you know, the major uh, global challenge in agriculture is the food security. Because nearly um, a billion people going hungry um, in the world. Uh, and, and then as the population is projected to reach like about 10 billion in, in 2050, as you can see. Uh, but when it comes to Africa, actually the challenge is even more because the population is projected to be doubled by 2050. So that means, you know, the agriculture production needs to be doubled, but we have the same amount of, of resources. Um, and then on top of that, the climate change is intensifying uh, the challenge. We already started seeing some harmful influences of the extreme climates, not only on plants, but also on the pathogens and pests affecting this crop productivity. So what we need for the sustainable agriculture is actually to close the yield gaps of the major staple food crops and enhance the food production. And in order to do so, we have to use the potential of the, all the technologies or tools available for us, including the new breeding tools, such as uh, uh, genome editing. Um, when it comes to the genetic modification, a lot of benefits has um, already been seen. Um, it's contributing to the sustainability and the production and the climate change solutions. Um, we have um, even, even now uh, quite a lot is happening within Africa. So like uh, BT cotton is already in many countries. Uh, 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 several uh, new countries have been added like, like Kenya. Um, uh, but also the, the big news was that like, you know, last year the, uh, the BT cowpea, which is the food crop actually was, was released um, in, in Nigeria for commercialization. And now Ghana has also 
ap approve that. Uh, outside of Africa, like you have seen that the, the Philippines have approved the, the golden uh, rice. So, so quite a good things going on on GM. Uh, so there are 19 uh, mega countries which grows uh, the, the GM crops, but there are also some small countries um, which have been included on the list like, like Kenya, Nigeria, um, uh, in, in Africa as well. But today my talk, I will more uh, focus on genome editing. Uh, so, because genome editing uh, is a technology which has been uh, used precisely and more efficiently to make the specific changes uh, in the DNA of a cell or the organism. So, what happens in this one, there is, uh, there is a double-stranded break, which can be done uh, using uh, these any of these uh, nucleases, either meganuclease, zinc finger nucleases, talons, or CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, once this a uh, double stranded break happens then you know the cell itself starts repairing and it can the repair can be non homologous and joining where it leads to the small insertions um, deletions or even um, some addition as well like a few base pair so basically you have the small indels and and the second uh, way of repair when particularly um, uh, the the, the the template is available, that's the homology directed repair. And in this case, mainly it leads to the insertion. Um, genome editing actually is not new. It, it has been happening since long time. So in the past, actually, whenever the mutations happen, then the, the farmers were the one who were like selecting the varieties. Um, but in like in the 20th century, the mutations were accelerated. Uh, through chemicals and then um, uh, radiations. So the radiation discovery was in um, 1895, uh, and then the first radiation-induced mutagenesis in plant was reported in 1927. Later on, uh, the more technologies were developed, which were more for the precise gene-targeted uh, mutations, uh, like talons, and before that was the zinc finger nucleases and, and mega nucleases. But recently in 2013, actually CRISPR uh, Cas9 um, uh, has uh, been reported, um, or I should say invented, which has actually won the Nobel Prize in 2020. Uh, and it has become actually the most popular genome editing approach right now. But you know, this is still keep on evolving because now after that it was base editing, CRISPR activation, and now, now the prime um, uh, editing. So if you see like all the tools available for genome editing, actually the CRISPR is about uh, more than 68% is actually uh, or for the product development is used uh, using the, the CRISPR. So genome editing can be used starting from the functional genomics for the gene discovery. It can be used for the nutrition enhancement. A lot of products are in the pipelines for the protein, vitamins, enhancement, like oil, starch, sugar, but also for the yield improvement, um, biotic stresses, resistance, like, you know, resistant to bacterial, viral, or fungal diseases, abiotic stress tolerance, and also for the, for the herbicide tolerance. Um, the interesting thing is, like, you know, if, if we compare through the transgenic approach, which was more the private sector driven, in this case, you will see the more projects are actually in the public and the ac academic sector in comparison to the to the private uh, private sector, so that's a difference. Uh, the way you know gene editing has been applied in comparison uh, to the transgenic. Um, the another difference is like you know, still the GM crops are actually the major few crops like you know, corn, soybean, cotton. But when it comes to the to the transgenic, like you know, the products which are in the pipeline, actually it's starting from the cereal up to the trees, you know, so it's like a is a lot, lot broad range of the crops um, which have been used. Actually, it's about like you know uh, more than twenty six crops um, have been uh, uh, in the pipeline, which are are more into the advanced R and D stage uh, using genome editing. 
So um, it, now this slide actually I'm I'm presenting because you know um, to understand like what is regulated, what's not regulated when it comes to the to the genome editing. So it's very uh, important to actually distinguish uh, the the type of editing is is happening, um, if, if so that one understand like you know what regulatory approaches uh, can be done. Um, so when there is uh, the site directed nucleases like you know the cut as i explained you know the repair can happen uh, two ways one is the non homologous and joining and then in this case there is no donor template and it leads to the then um, the the gene silencing or the gene knockout or mainly mainly is like a small indels and then uh, these small indels like so this is the sdn one type of uh, of editing but when the donor template is is um, present then actually it leads to the uh, directed uh, uh, homologous recombination so in that case actually the donor template with the some correction is there and 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 then that correction can be copied through the gene editing and so that allows the introduction of the of the mutations at the target site but is it still the small mutation the third type is, which is SDN3, is where the, the donor template is present, and then it is like a gene insertion or the replacement. So the full gene can be can be inserted as well. And so this allows actually the integration or introduction of the gene or the genetic um, elements at the at the target site. Uh, so SDN1 type of uh, mutations are actually not regulated in several countries because in this case there is no foreign gene integration but sdn3 type of mutations depending upon where, from where the donor template is coming if the donor template is from the same plant species then it is cisgenic but if the donor template is has the has the genetic element from different plant species then actually it is treated as transgenic so basically saying that none of the genome edited products are regulated as gm that's not true you know is only the sdn1 type where, where there is no foreign gene integration are the products which are actually uh, similar uh, to the products which are coming through the other um, uh, natural mutations or through the breeding. So they are not regulated um, as GMO. They, they can be going through the regulatory pathway, which normally the hybrid varieties go through. So just giving you some idea about the global overview of legislation for, for genome editing. So in this map, the countries which are shaded in green, these are the countries where the genome edited uh, crops are not regulated as GMOs if they don't have any foreign gene integration. Um, so um, US, um, Canada, and then quite a lot of countries in Latin America uh, and, and Australia, China, India, Philippines, Japan, these are the countries. Um, and there are uh, yellow are the countries which are, where the discussion is going on. So when we come to, to Africa, Actually, Nigeria is the first country who has approved the guideline um, uh, last year uh, that uh, for that, you know, if there is no foreign gene integration, uh, then the products, the gene edited products are not regulated as GM. Kenya has joined them early this year. And recently, a few weeks back, actually, Malawi has also um, joined them. Um, but then uh, South Africa, is the country actually who has taken decision that you know um, that uh, gene edited products will be treated as GMOs, uh, similar to what is happening in Europe and uh, and New Zealand. Um, in Europe, um, uh, so actually, basically, is UK is the country where they have recently approved field trials. Um, as non-GM for the gene edited, but the, the uh, uh, remaining, like you know, for the further commercialization or release of the product, they, it is still under under discussion. 
So now I will give you um, example uh, how we are working on, on banana for this technology. Um, and why we are working on banana is like, you know, it is the one of the major staple food crop um, grown in over 136 countries in tropics and subtropics. Um, when it comes to Africa, it is actually a very important staple food crop. The, its world production is about 163 million tons, but a third of that banana comes from, from Africa. And in Africa, actually, it is grown by mainly by the smallholder farmers. And East Africa is the largest banana producing, as well as the consuming region in Africa. Um, so in, in several countries uh, in Africa, actually the annual consumption is quite high, is about 21 kilograms of banana plantain per capita. And when it comes to Uganda and Rwanda, actually the consumption is about 0 0.7 kilogram uh, um, uh, of banana daily per, per person, because that's like a, is like mashed potatoes or rice or, or wheat in other countries. So this is the dish called matuke. Uh, the people eat um, in, in Uganda with some sauce. Uh, sometimes it's the peanut sauce. Um, even though it's very important crop, but there is a huge yield gap um, in both the plantain, uh, the plantain as well as in the banana uh, production. And this is one of the reason, um, one of the constraint is actually the diseases and pest. And there are a lot of diseases, um, including the fungal disease like black cigatoka, fusarium will, there is also this bacterial disease. Uh, and there are viruses like banana bunchy top virus, banana streak virus, and then there are pest nematodes uh, and weevil. The major problem is that, you know, many of these pathogens and pests they coexist. So that means in the same farmer's field, you can find more than one pathogen and pest there. As you can see from, from this figure, um, uh, you know, this multiple color uh, dot means, you know, is the different pest and pathogen in the same place. So at IATA, we have a, a quite big and strong genetic improvement program of, of banana. And uh, we are we are focusing on the disease uh, resistance, um, and because like uh, our aim is uh, to develop improved banana varieties with a broad spectrum resistance to various diseases and and pests, and we apply all the different tools available to us. We start with the selection of the germplasm if there is resistant varieties already available um, in in the um, in the germplasm pool. What we have once the when the new pathogen or pest the threat comes in, uh, we have quite strong. I will say one of the strongest uh, conventional breeding program um, at IATA, and and then in the biotech we have the transgenic as well as the gene editing uh, program. So in the transgenic we are right now focusing on the bananas and tomunas will. Uh, but today I will mainly focus on the gene editing uh, examples. So I'll give you the example of the banana streak virus and also the banana um, xanthomonas wilt, but we are also working on the fusarium wilt as well. Um, so uh, in uh, what we do is like, you know, once we have a problem in order to uh, 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 to select the tool we want to apply is actually based on what is available. Um, so the conventional breeding program, as you know, that in in the conventional breeding of banana um, is a long. It takes long time, but it has a low cost, and there is no regulatory issues there. Uh, but the limitation is that if you want to develop a disease resistant variety, and if the resistant trait is not available in any of the germplasm or in one of the parent, then, then you know, we cannot apply uh, the conventional uh, breeding. Um, then we, uh, we go for either for the transgenic or the genome editing. For the transgenic, uh, we are bringing the, the genes from other plant species. Um, so this is a medium term, but it is quite high cost because of the regulation. And then definitely the, the safety regulation is required. Uh, for gene editing, that's where we are like really tweaking uh, the endogenous uh, genes within the banana. So it is comparatively 
shorter in comparison to transgenic approach uh, and as well as the conventional approach. It is uh, low to medium cost compared to, to transgenic and the regulation will depend upon the country policies. Uh, so we started the, the genome editing uh, work of, of Banana in uh, 2015. Um, so my lab was actually the first um, to get the approval uh, by National Biosafety Authority in Kenya for, for genome editing of the banana for, for virus uh, resistance. And, and then uh, in, by 2018, we had the, the full platform available uh, uh, for establishing um, uh, for for genome editing of of banana and and both banana and plantain, and then we started working on uh, bacterial wilt in 2020, and recently we started working on on fusarium wilt. And our plan is actually to take the gene edited uh, product, uh, uh, not product actually, I should say, the gene edited uh, banana for the field trial by early next year. Um, so we have established the CRISPR-Cas9-based genome editing uh, for banana and plantain um, using uh, this uh, multiple guide RNAs uh, and, and then targeting a visual marker of phytoin desaturase. So when, when PDS is uh, functional, then the plants are green, but if we make the PDS non-functional by creating the targeted mutations, then we, we get the albino uh, plants, as you can see here. And then we do the target sequencing to actually uh, detect the, the mutations. Um, so uh, after establishing the protocol, actually the first trait we worked on is the banana streak uh, virus. And I'll say why we picked the banana streak virus, because when long back when I joined IATA, actually this was my first project to work on the banana streak virus. And we were using the RNAi technology. And we never got a success with the RNAi technology because RNAi not necessarily will give you 100% uh, silencing. But with the, with the gene editing, actually, you can get the 100%. So you know, when once this system was established um, in my lab, actually, I, I went back uh, to work on the banana uh, streak virus. So, so banana streak virus is a double-stranded Badna virus. Um, and so, you know, this is like a, about 7.2 to 7.8 kb uh, streak virus. And it, so it is actually in two forms, episomal and in a integrated. So it integrates in the B genome of banana. So, uh, People who doesn't know banana, actually banana has two genomes, A genome and the B genome. And most of the cultivated bananas are triploid. So they can be triple A. All the dessert bananas, actually what you see in the supermarkets are triple A. Uh, plantains are AAB. Uh, Matoke bananas, the cooking types are also triple A. And there are some bananas also which are ABB. Um, so this, a streak virus is a problem only in the bee genome. So this is not a problem in the desert banana. This is problem in the plantains. And so it integrates there. Uh, so a streak virus, it can be in the episomal form like this, or it can be in the integrated form. Uh, it has three open reading frame and it is a mono, it has a monopartite genome. So open reading frame one and two are are small and they are mainly involved in the virion assembly, but open reading frame three is, is the big, uh, uh, big open reading frame. And this actually encodes a polyprotein, uh, which is cleaved by aspartic protease and uh, post uh, transcriptionally. And then, you know, then these, all these functional proteins are there. So this, uh, open reading frame and codes actually all the essential uh, genes like movement protein, code protein, spartic protease, reverse transcriptase, and RNAs H. And when it is integrated, it can be in a direct or inverted tandem repeats, but it always integrates at a single locus in the in the B genome. And this integrated uh, BSV is 
also is uh, is called EBSB, is endogenous BSB, and it is actually the integration integrated form is almost present in all the plantain uh, varieties. And under the stress condition, when the plants are uh, in is stressed, and that is stress can be environmental stress, like you know change in the temperature or drought, or it can be uh, the tissue culture or, or the breeding uh, process itself. So under these type of stresses, this integrated version actually gets activated into the episomal. When the plant has the integrated BSV, they don't show any symptom. But once they are activated into the episomal, they show very nice, these yellow streaks, um, which is the peculiar symptom of the banana streak virus. So for that reason, actually, the breeders cannot use the parents, which has the B genome in their, their breeding program. Um, so uh, my idea for here for the editing was that, you know, to inactivate um, the integrated version of streak virus so that it doesn't get activated into the episomal. So the strategy uh, uh, we have developed was like, you know, to create the targeted mutation in all the three open reading frames. And for the third open reading frame, actually I targeted aspartic protease because my intention was that if I make the aspartic protease non-functional, in that case, all of the proteins will become non-functional because there will be no cleavage will, will be happen um, in this uh, open reading frame three. Um, so what we did was like we used a banana, a, a, a plantain um, called goncha manjaya, which is uh, commonly grown in Uganda. Um, so we picked up, up from the field and we have initiated it um, in the tissue culture. And then after that, we have characterized that plantain to see um, that if it has the integrated um, endogenous streak virus. So we did uh, uh, all the molecular characterization and we have seen that, yes, it has the same pattern. Uh, um, inverted repeats and and so it was integrated. After that, we have uh, designed the guide RNA targeting those uh, three targets, and then we have um, uh, multiplexed those ones, and then we have delivered the the CRISPR Cas9 into the cell suspension of plantain, and and then we have regenerated the complete uh, the plant lights like here. And we have done the molecular characterization further to, to check um, for the mutations. So uh, we have also done the sequencing of the, of the, of the targets. Um, and then what happened in the, uh, because the open reading frame one and two were small, so our targets were quite close. It was like about 198 ba base pairs far. So in the cases where the Cas9 has cut simultaneously at both the targets, we got the big deletion of 198 base pair. But the uh, for open reading frame three, we we saw all the small indels because you know there was no second guide, so it was only one one guide uh, there. Um, and after confirming uh, the targeted mutations, um, we have actually evaluated these mutants in the glass house. So we mimic the drought condition for them. And this is our wild type where you can see very clear um, yellow streaks. And, and these were our mutants. So our 75% mutants actually didn't show any symptom after stress. But our two events, these ones, showed um, some uh, streaks there. And I was very curious to see like what was happening there. So these two, two events have actually indels only in the open reading frame one and two, and they didn't have um, any mutations in open reading frame three, which actually explains you know, why they have the symptoms because open reading frame three plays a crucial role in the symptom, uh, symptom development. Uh, so I, I think because of the aspartic protease uh, uh, I have uh, mentioned before. So we have further tested the virus load in, in uh, these, these plants and we have seen that yes, there was no virus load in, in the events which were not 
uh, showing the symptom. So now we have the proof of concept that we can inactivate the integrated um, streak, uh, uh, streak virus um, so that you know um, once they have this targeted mutation, actually uh, the episomal uh, forms cannot be activated and they, they will not show the symptoms. So right now what we are uh, doing because we have used the plasmid-based um, delivery uh, so what we are doing right now is we are improving the parents which are used in the plantain breeding. And so we have in my lab, we are working with the 4X hybrid because that's the last step of crossing the 4X are crossed with the 2X improved. And then in the end, you get the 3X plantain hybrid. So we are now improving this 4X and the improved 2X and then once we uh, those will be uh, uh, mutated and the crossed, actually then um, the CRISPR-Cas reagents, which are integrated there, can be segregated out, and our final product will be actually the non-GM. Okay, so the second example I'll show is the banana xanthomonas wilt. Um, this is a problem um, in East. East Africa um, in the Great Lakes region. Actually, this disease uh, was initially reported several decades back um, in Ethiopia on a crop called Ansett, which is uh, closely related to banana, and then later on on bananas in Ethiopia. Uh, but later, after some time, uh, it was reported in, in Uganda. And since it was reported in Uganda, actually, it is actually uh, present in all the even um, um, in the Great Lakes region, which the, which are which is the major banana growing area, and because of this disease, actually the the losses can be from forty to about eighty percent because of the disease. Um, we have done some work on the susceptibility of the different banana genotypes. So all the different banana genotypes tested has been shown susceptible. The only that there might be some variation in the susceptibility. Uh, th those, there are some uh, varieties of bananas which has the persistent bract. These are the varieties which can escape the disease because this disease, this uh, the bacterial pathogen actually spreads um, uh, through the insect. It is an insect transmitted disease. So, um, and, and then the insects actually transmit the disease through the flowers because in, in banana, actually normally these bracts opens up uh, and, and that's the moist cushion is the one where the insect goes and, and actually infect. Um, so these, but these varieties, which has the persistent bract, they can, in, um, they can escape the insect mediated transmission, but they don't have the, uh, the, the resistance uh, at the cellular level. Um, so if the farmers, the another way of spreading the disease is, is the farmers using the contaminated tool because when they, they prune the plants, when they cut the dried leaves, that's when another, the farmers can spread. So, so these, even these varieties get um, uh, infected at that point. Only the wild type, uh, Musa balbiciana uh, was found to be resistant uh, uh, to this disease. And, and, and also there are uh, Musa acuminata subspecies, Brena and Benkesai, which has some tolerance uh, against the, this bacterial pathogen. Um, so overall economic losses because of this disease is, is about two to eight billion over a decade. And is basically because of this, like once the disease is there, it is spreads very fast. Um, and then it leads into the absolute crop loss. And then, you know, there is no other remedy um, than to uproot, uproot the plants. So that's why, you know, that the resistance has been the best and the most cost effective method of managing the disease. Um, so uh, we did the molecular basis of the disease resistance in Musa balbiciana, which is also the banana progenitor against this disease. So what we did was we did a comparative transcriptome um, analysis of, uh, uh, of the resistant variety of the resistant germplasm, which is Musa balbiciana, compared to the susceptible um, uh, after infection with the Xanthomonas campestris. And then based on this, we have actually identified the targets um, uh, for, um, uh, so we have identified several susceptibility genes 
um, and also some of the uh, transporter genes uh, uh, or, or the negative regulators of the defense genes, which can be knockout um, for developing the resistance. So right now, what we are trying to do is we are taking the information from Musa Balbisiana and we are transferring that information um, to the susceptible uh, variety. Uh, uh, one approach we are using is the knockdown uh, um, uh, of the susceptibility genes. Um, and then our final product will be non-GM because there will be no foreign uh, uh, gene uh, integrated in that one. And then the second one is the overexpression of the defense gene, because during the comparative uh, transcriptomic, we also identified uh, PR genes um, and some of the R genes, which we are trying to overexpress. And for overexpression, we are either using the CRISPR activation to endogenous, uh, to activate the endogenous genes, uh, several folds, or we are using the traditional transgenic uh, uh, approach because even the, the products coming out from the CRISPR activation are also treated as uh, the transgenic because for CRISPR activation, you have to actually integrate uh, the CRISPR reagents up there. And so that means their foreign gene is integrated. But, but the, the mutants with the knockouts are actually uh, non-GM, and those are not regulated, at least in Nigeria and, and Kenya in, in Africa. Um, so one example of that one is like, um, so we have worked with a downy mildew resistant R, which is a susceptibility gene, and this gene actually gets activated during the host pathogen in interaction, like you, if you can see here, uh, we have actually infected the uh, uh, the Sukalindizi, which is a susceptible variety, as well as the, uh, the Musa Balbisiana, and we saw about 60% up uh, um, regulation of the Musa DMR6 ortholog uh, in this case. So we have actually find out the, the gene, which uh, 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 the targets which we wanted to do the knockout. So we have created the DMR6 uh, mutants, um, and then after the, these mutants, initially we have actually tested them using the rapid screening method where we have uh, this small tissue culture plantlets um, and we just inoculate the, uh, the bacteria um, and, and then, you know, these plants show symptoms very quickly within the, the two weeks time. So this is the, the wild type and these are the, the, the mutants. Um, and we have detected the mutants based on the target sequencing. And then further, we have tested them in the glass house. So this is our mutant, which didn't show any symptom after um, challenging with the bacteria. And this is our wild type, uh, which has completely wilted um, after challenging. And so this photograph was taken 60 days after uh, inoculation. And then the, our wild type control plants actually com built completely within 20 to 30 days. And for we have also uh, checked on the plant growth because you know DMR6 is uh, has been reported um, uh, for impacting uh, on the growth. So we have checked, and in our case, actually we didn't find um, any negative impact um, of the knockout of the DMR6 on the plant growth. We did the leaf uh, leaf area and the pseudo stem girth and the plant height as well. And the main reason about that is like, you know, there are seven uh, DMR6 uh, uh, orthologs in, in banana, but you know, uh, we only um, identified one and we actually targeted only one. So we didn't knock out all DMR6. We only knocked out one DMR6, uh, so that's so that you know it doesn't impact uh, the growth of the plant, but it has shown um, enhanced resistance, actually 100% uh, resistance at least at the glasshouse level, and we are planning to actually test these plants under the field conditions now. Um, so with the genome editing, actually there are uh, the biosafety regulators have mainly the two concern. One is the um, unwanted genetic changes in the plants, which we also say or call it off-target mutations. Um, so, you know, we can minimize the, the off-target mutation um, actually by uh, at the level of the guide RNA design, and we always do that. 
And then the second also is like, you know, if, uh, if you use the uh, ribonucleoprotein delivery, because in case of the ribonucleoprotein delivery, the, the, the CRISPR reagents are only active for a short while. After that, actually, they get degraded. So that means there is no continuous uh, uh, mutations there. So with that one, you can reduce. And then you can also, once you have identified a mutant, you can also test that mutant if it has any off-target uh, mutation or not. So because you can easily pick, and we have tested it in, in banana, and then, you know, uh, uh, the, the chances of off-target mutation is, is, uh, is almost negligible, I should say. And then the another concern is the transgene integration. So you have to actually prove to the, to the regulators that, you know, your product has no... Um, a, a transgene integration in that. And, and so for, for uh, there are two ways, if you are doing, um, uh, uh, there are two ways that you can make sure that there is no transgene integration. One is that you develop a DNA-free genome editing um, a system in which you use the preassembled uh, CRISPR-Cas9 ribonucleoprotein. So that means the guide RNA is uh, as RNA and, and then Cas9 is as a protein. And, and so, as I said, you know, this, this one doesn't get integrated into the plant genome. Um, so that means your final product has no integration of them. But if you're using the plasmid-based delivery, in that case, actually, you can do the back crossing to segregate the, the transgene out. And this is very easily done in the cereal crops, in the legumes, but it is difficult uh, for the vegetatively propagated crops like like banana. So in, we are developing the transgene free genome editing system for banana. And we are using two different approach. One is actually using the, uh, the RNPs, uh, uh, either like, you know, putting into the um, cell suspension um, and directly like bombarding the CRISPR gas reagents uh, uh, using ballistic uh, or, or going through the protoplast. And, and so in this case, you know, the final plantlet will have no uh, transgene integration. The second approach we are using right now is uh, we are using a technology called Cas Clover. And then, you know, uh, uh, we are excising um, the, the gene editing reagents after the mutation. So, so once the mutants are developed and we make sure that uh, they have the mutation, and after that, because uh, uh, we have the system to excise, so in the end, the product will be the transgene free. So this is the system actually, which is working well in our, in our hands. And so, so that we can have the final product, which has uh, no, no transgene integration in them. Uh, you know, for any new technology, uh, it's very important that, you know, we have to communicate uh, for the new technology, but also to build the capacity. So my group, we are heavily involved uh, in, in communication and capacity building. And then when we say communication, we have different audiences for that. Like we have regulators, we have journalists, and, and, and we have also the scientists to whom we are communicating. And we are communicating at, at very different uh, uh, platforms, and we are uh, collaborating with a lot of um, uh, uh, um, expertise into the communication, and one of them is the Alliance for Science. Um, and we are also doing the science stories, you know, explaining in a very simple language. Uh, we are also collaborating with ISA so that, you know, for the gene editing, uh, we communicate about gene editing in a right manner. Uh, for the capacity building, we are... Um, we started actually organizing the workshops from 2017. We are training PhD students. Um, and also actually uh, starting January, uh, we are partnering with uh, UC Davis and, um, and others at UC Berkeley and uh, with this African uh, Orphan Crops Consortium uh, for, uh, for training African scientists. So this will be like, you know, we, we our plan is to train about 80 to 100 African scientists uh, with, with, that, with that platform. And the first batch will, so each batch will be like a 20 
um, scientist and the first batch will start actually in January uh, 2023. Uh, so that's the that's an, uh, and then we are actually uh, uh, providing a lot of hands off training to the people who comes to the lab and the, so that so that you know uh, there is enough capacity built in Africa uh, for for genome um, editing. But initially, when we started uh, uh, the capacity, we included in, in even the regulators so that they understand the science behind this this new technology and which was very important uh, because what i have noticed that in in africa uh, the regulators are actually uh, uh, have changed their behavior because before when it was the transgenic actually they were looking at at the different uh, various countries mainly europe uh, and which has a negative impact in in adoption of the technology but when it came to the genome editing actually they are developing the guidelines the regulatory guidelines which are science based and and you know they have consulted uh, uh, all over you know including uh, us uh, uh, europe asian countries and and you know they have following argentina because argentina has the best uh, guideline for the uh, for the gene editing so that's what like kenya and nigeria uh, they have followed in developing the guideline for for the genome editing. Okay, so in the end, I would like to summarize. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, the genome editing tools are becoming quite popular molecular tools of choice, not only for the crop improvement, but also for the functional genomics. And even in genome editing, the CRISPR has become uh, quite most popular uh, genome engineering approach. And mainly because it's simple, efficient, um, it, it's it's quite specific, and you can do multiplexing of the traits with it, and it's very easy to to adapt. So if if uh, uh, any place where there is a tissue culture facility, uh, bioinformatics, and the transformation protocol available, and the reference genome is there, then you know people can can apply uh, uh, genome genome editing. The major concern uh, there are two major concern of, of it is the off-target mutation and the transgene integration. It's very important to understand what type of uh, edits you are getting so that you understand like, you know, whether they will be regulated as GM or not. Um, genome edited crops with no foreign gene integrations uh, are not regulated as GM in several countries. And in our lab, we have uh, shown the application of CRISPR-Cas9 based genome editing uh, uh, for disease resistance. Uh, we have also developed the, the genome editing platform for, for YAM, but we have just the protocol there. We haven't started working on any trade yet. And, and, and we are building the capacity of young African uh, researchers in the field of, of genome editing. Uh, we are not doing this alone. We are, we are having a, a partnering with, with different organization uh, like uh, University of uh, California Davis, uh, Dimitra Bio, um, and also the national partners in, in um, Uganda and Kenya, and then Alliance for Science and uh, Corteva and Iowa State uh, University. And I would like to thank uh, my team and, and as well as the financial support uh, from various donors. Um, thank you very much. I will be happy to take any question. Yeah, thank you, Lina. So we have some time uh, for a couple of questions. Anyone in the audience, graduate student? Uh, uh, yeah, I have one. I mean, um, so banana has uh, a genome, B genome. So when you design um, the Cas9, the target, how you, I mean, a specific like want to modify component in B genome, but not A genome, or the vice versa, I mean, how you deal with this situation? Yeah, so I think the, the, the variety, so we are working on the Matuke varieties, like a cooking type of banana. So all of them are triple A. So in that case, we target A genome. Uh, but when we work on the plantains, actually that's when we have to target uh, both A genome 
and the bee genome. Uh, but the, the trait we have used for plantain was the banana streak virus, and banana streak virus doesn't integrate into the A genome. So our target was very easy. We have only targeted the B genome for, for, the, for the plantain. Um, that's how we are doing. And then I think the, the reference genome is not available for all the, all the varieties. So we actually, to avoid any SNPs within the guide RNA, actually we do the target sequencing. So, you know, once we know this is our target we want to use, then uh, we amplify that target and we, we sequence it. Yeah, my second question, how acceptable, I mean, the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 generated plant uh, banana being accepted by Eastern African uh, farmer or consumer? Yeah, uh, very good push. So recently in one of our uh, communication workshop, actually we invited a farmer representative um, and we, we actually asked them that question. And so, and uh, basically the farmers, what they are interested in is the trait, you know? So if they are like really getting problems with a, with a disease where, you know, a lot of uh, production, they are facing a lot of production losses. In that case, if you give them uh, uh, the resistant varieties which performs well, so they are more interested in the performance of that variety rather than the technology which has been used to develop, develop that that technology. So, um, like we haven't done um, uh, the the um, any impact analysis or anything for uh, for adoption. We haven't done any study. But previously, we did that type of study for the transgenic, and you know, uh, we felt like you know farmers uh, they are interested in the traits rather than the technology used for developing that trait. Great. Yeah, great to hear. Yeah, with this, I think uh, so. We are running out of time. Yeah, thank you so much, Rina. So be from so you are in Kenya now. Oh, I mean, uh, yes, today I'm in Kenya. Yes, midnight. I mean, that's thank you so much. Yeah, for your uh, effort, and uh, we really enjoy your talk. Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.